and uh, this first uh, keynote speaker is Dr. Mark Rosekind, and he's a Chief Safety Innovation Officer at Zooks. Rather than have a, a keynote, I have the good fortune of having a fireside chat with Mark. Mark has attended all of the World Safety Summits, and uh, we appreciate your insight, Mark. Uh, welcome to the uh, World Safety Summit 2021. Hi, Charlie. It's always great to see you and uh, always appreciate the opportunity to talk safety. I know uh, you do. I, that's what I, I love that. And so let's make sure everybody knows your background as far as that goes, because uh, you're so enthusiastic about it. Sure. I, just very quickly, I talk about being on my sixth career. Uh, I'm actually trained as a scientist. My expertise is in sleep and human fatigue. And I did that work in academic universities and at NASA. I had my own company for a number of years. Um, that covers three of those careers. And uh, that actually began in Washington when President Obama appointed me to be one of the five board members at the National Transportation Safety Board. So for five years, I had a chance to investigate major transportation crashes all over the country and all modes of transportation. And after that five-year term, uh, uh, President Obama then appointed me to be the head of NHTSA, the administrator of the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. Um, and I did that until the president left. And since then, I've been at Zooks. And, and thank you for getting the title right, because at Zooks, I am the chief safety innovation officer. I think the only one in the world with that title. And we just point out, it's the Zooks emphasis on safety innovation, just like you know all the cool technology that's being innovated. We think there's a great opportunity to focus on the innovation in the safety arena as well. Well, we appreciate you being here and the work that you've done at Zooks, and we want to get to that. But before I do, when you know you mentioned NHTSA, and Christina and I were talking about, you know, in in the intro, unfortunately, this uh, study came out over the last six months, and we've seen this spike of fatality. It's just so disheartening uh, that that continues on. I'd love your comments on that. You know, I think the first thing for us is to stop the lurching. You know, it, it, this is a crisis that's been in place for decades now. I mean, just to be clear, in 2020, it was 38,680 lives lost, you know, 100 every day. Now, we've seen that go up the highest since 2006, but it's already a crisis. Uh, and 95% of all lives lost in transportation are on our roadways. And so while I think it's great that we track this to kind of know how we're going up or down, the reality is this has been a crisis for a long time that should be totally unacceptable for us. Um, and so it's great to see, you know, the secretary announce a new program, a road safety plan that's coming, et cetera. Um, but we need to be doing something now and then staying focused on it, not just when we see a spike or slow down a little bit when we see it come down a little bit. It's been too high for too long. Yeah, I totally agree. And it seems like, you know, unfortunately, when you and I met, you know, five or 10 years ago, and, and if we would have progressed, maybe we wouldn't see the fully autonomous car yet, but we might have seen incremental drops in that number. It still would be unacceptable, but it would have been nice to have gone 30 or even approaching 20. Now, again, 20,000 lives lost a year. I'm not suggesting it's acceptable, but with these uh, developments that are rolling out, again, in advanced driver assist systems, et cetera, boy, I would have hoped to have seen some reduction in that. So I'm just, uh, it's troublesome that, that we haven't experienced that to the degree that and, I think we should have. And you've got it, you know, it used to be close to 50,000 a year, Yeah. you know, and then it drops down. And, and that's your point is we'd love to see it steadily decreasing and start getting some real, you know, let's see it really drop for a period. But instead we get this up and down, up and down, up and down kind of thing. I always say when the number goes down, we need to celebrate because those are lives, right. right? Those are people that are still with us. Right. Um, but you know, to your point, what we want to see is that steady decline. Yeah. Um, and there is a report that was done. Uh, there was a Road to Zero group that got started. Debbie Herzman, Jeff Michael were sort of the co-chairs. They worked with RAND, 1600 organizations, part of it. Um, and there was a study that said we could get to zero in 30 years, but that's going to take us doing what works, emphasizing even further the safe system approach, and then advancing new technology. And so to your point, we can't expect that, you know, in one year, even five years, we're going to see that, you know, let's get down to zero. It's going to take us a long time, but we need to see that decline to know we're on the right track. You're right. And, and I mean, just to take off a, a boy, a thousand a year in, in that situation would be would be great because again those are real lives real real people um we will want to study more on that let's talk a little bit about these changes that we've seen just 
through the pandemic, these new cases that are coming up. Christina mentioned a couple of them. I'd love to get your viewpoint on any learnings we've had experiencing this worldwide pandemic and the call to, you know, again, further development in, in safety and in autonomy. Uh, this is something I learned at the NTSB and, and my, my PhD is actually in psychology. So let me just say, changing human behavior can be hard. Okay, so, you know, the, the two big ones that are cited in the huge, the 20,120 lives lost in the first half, the two big things are speeding and people not wearing their seatbelts. Oh, no. Okay. And so, you know, again, it's just really hard to get people to change their behavior. So just with seatbelts, 91% of people in our country wear their seatbelts now. But in crashes where somebody dies, half the people aren't wearing their seatbelts. Okay. And so, you know, again, I think we, we need to see where the advantage of technology is. And that's, you know, kind of been talked about already, but we need to focus, you know, human behavior can be difficult to change. So wherever we can get technology to offset some of those bad things, um, to make sure you can see in the dark, um, that you're not allowed to go faster than you should, right? That your car won't actually move until your seatbelt's on. Um, these are things where we could use technology to help us where changing human behavior can be very difficult. Yeah. And, and then uh, again, through the, the, this pandemic, though, in terms of, of some of the things that we've experienced um, as we're coming out of it, boy, we, ha we had that, that pause almost, a moment in time where people weren't using the road or weren't using transportation in, in the scale that they had before. Is there anything, any takeaways from that, that that we learned? Yeah, I think, you know, what's interesting is the, the last statistic in that, which is not just the numbers going up and how big the increase is, but the vehicle miles traveled actually went down significantly, right? So we've got lives lost and yet less travel because of the pandemic. Um, and so I think especially people who've been out on the road know that, man, folks are just whizzing by, you know, at speeds yeah. that we haven't seen when everybody's crowded out there and you just can't go that fast, right? Um, and so again, the pandemic's created an environment where certain things have emerged. Um, again, certain human behavior things that we just sort of do when we can um, and that's created, you know, these risky situations for things. And, and the last thing I'll just add, which has been mentioned, but I think the pandemic has showed us things like deliveries become part of infrastructure, right? I mean, that's just like, right. who would have thought, right? That all that FedEx and Prime and UPS and all of Dort, all these things now are really critical just for us to get what we need at home or in other settings. That, that I know even in our little community, it all of a sudden became an issue in terms of accessibility where it wasn't as prominent or, or, or prevalent as it was before. You talk about uh, your own experience with a previous administration. We have now a new administration. Let's just talk, <clears throat> talk about the attitudes and the changes that come with the new administration like we have. Yeah, you know, Charlie, that's such an insightful question because every group is going to have sort of their own interests, style, et cetera. Um, the other thing is it takes a long time to get your personnel in place. And so as much as people, you know, the president comes in January and everyone in February, it's like, are we there yet? You know, has everything been changed? Are lives being saved? Um, and so I, I just want to say, I think the, the new group that's there has been great to watch. Um, you know, they, they have a new system for reporting when crashes occur in autonomous vehicles. Um, they're doing investigations that are going on right now. The secretary just announced the road safety plan. Uh, we're all looking forward to seeing what that's going to actually look like when it comes out. But there's clearly um, some action going on. We all have to wait to see how they evolve. Um, but it's good to see those things at least being talked about now and some of those things just starting to come into place. Well, I love to see the word safety re-entering the conversation because it seemed like so much of it was about, you know, power in terms of, you know, electrification, which certainly is, is a big deal. And, and maybe that's the more obvious change that's happening uh, around us. And we don't always understand the incremental safety changes. And, and I know I'm, I can only imagine what that means. Someone in your career in terms of a safety innovation officer where you can be very about something, but if it's not changing a statistic or people don't see it in action, maybe it's not as obvious. Yeah, and what you're also bringing up is the agency, NHTSA, mm -hmm. has a very large portfolio. I mean, I, you know, as, as administrator, all of a sudden I'm learning like, oh, we're in charge of the EMS 911 system. Oh, we've got this, oh, we've got that. It's a very large portfolio. But the point that you're bringing up that's really critical is that safety is at the core, right? I mean, that is at the core. 
Um, and, and by the way, that was something that was raised that I want to be always emphasizing is people love to talk about, you know, safety first, safety is a priority. Since my MTSB days, I don't like to talk about it that way. Safety needs to be a core value, foundational to everything you do. And the reason for that is priorities change, right? You may say safety is a priority today, but tomorrow it's schedule or the budget, right? Um, there's a house being constructed in our neighborhood and there's this list of 14 things that are quote the priorities. And what's funny is number 12 on the list, no. safety first. <laughs> you know? yeah. So, so you know, the, uh, other things are happening. Obviously, uh, you know, one of the, the cores uh, that we've been talking about for many years, safety is, you know, full autonomy. Um, we, we obviously haven't seen it. We've learned that there's, uh, again, perhaps this protects the occupants more than it uh, in the, but it adversely impacts the people outside of the vehicle. Can you talk a little bit about the safety in terms of inside a vehicle versus those that are outside or victims of a vehicle that's not behaving correctly? Yeah, and I think that's a great point of how we need to set objectives and performance objectives. And, and to your point, um, every everything tells us it should be the same, right? I mean, th there's no reason that there's a lower priority on a life inside the vehicle than outside. And so anybody that's going for full autonomy really needs to take the full road system into consideration. So yeah, you wanna protect people in the vehicle just as much as you're gonna be protecting people outside the vehicle. And we didn't hear the numbers, but the, they've all gone up. The vulnerable road users that are out there around vehicles, those numbers of lives lost have gone up as well. And in a really safe system with full autonomy, you should be going after everybody being safe. Yeah, definitely. Um, let's, we, we can't not mention in terms of any uh, technolo technological uh, advancements and, and developments, this chip shortage. Uh, can you just speak to a little bit how you guys view that or, or your, yourself with your experience and, and where you see the end? Yeah, I think that uh, I'll just comment as far as our experience, which is, you know, we're still in development. Um, we're doing a lot of testing, but uh, at the moment we're of a size where it's not having a huge effect. I think what people are concerned about is, you know, how long this persists. And so if you're starting to move into larger pilot programs, scaling, et cetera, then we're gonna start seeing uh, schedules significantly. They're already being affected, uh, but the longer this goes on, the more significant uh, those delays are gonna become. Yeah, it, it's, it's frustrating. And, and unfortunately something, again, that, that hopefully these, gosh, these worldwide events, <laughs> I'm a little bit <laughs> tired of them, uh, but we're, we're hopefully we're learning for them. Um, okay, so we talked about safety and I, I did brush over, but let, let's circle back now a little bit and talk about some of the other advantages to some of these developments, some of the innovation that's happening. Uh, let's start with, again, um, We'll go back to EV and we'll go back to pollution, uh, incorporating EV in the drivetrain and, and throughout a vehicle's operation. A couple quick comments, please. Sure. I, I like to talk about the trifecta, you know, that fully autonomous vehicles and some ATIS work gets us to enhancing safety, sustainability, and mobility, all three of those. And the safety we've talked about, sustainability we heard, you know, anywhere from a quarter to a third of greenhouse gases are transportation related. And mobility means moving people, uh, including folks as we get older, um, you know, the community with disabilities and even kids, you know, that don't have access right now. That just moving people, uh, which means access to food deserts and, and healthcare, et cetera. So these new technologies mean opening up and enhancing safety the mobility part and the sustainability. Why I bring that up is because what you're highlighting is how many different opportunities we have in our society to get three big ones like that. Yeah. And so if we do it right, we have a chance to make a marked difference for our society in every one of those areas. Um, and I think while everybody's like, you know, let's go for the big bold. And again, because of my NASA experience, I, I believe in moonshots, go big and bold. Um, but I always like to point out is that, you know, even with big and bold, the further you get, the more opportunity and benefits that you reap from that big, bold opportunity. 
just a quick segue because you mentioned NASA and, and uh, we have the FAA also. We, we have uh, on the fringe, you know, we talk about these, these frustrations in, in transportation boldly, but we as a nation have had some very successful events or, you know, again, our aviation uh, safety record is uh, enviable worldwide, that type of thing. So we, we, we understand uh, when it's done you know, correctly, I guess maybe that adds to the frustration when, uh, when we still have issues in the transport, other parts of the transportation sector. You know, Charlie, why that's such a good point is there are a lot of people in automotive who are like, I don't want to hear about aviation anymore. And, and I'm the opposite. Coming from NASA, you know, I'm recovering NASA scientists thinking there's so much to be learned. I mean, in aviation in the United States, we went 12 years with no fatality in a commercial crash or incident. 12 years, zero, you know, and it's kind of like automotive, get there, you know, and then you can talk about that you've got nothing else to learn. So I think, you know, aviation has had a lot of safety programs, a lot of automation that they've had to contend with and human interaction. And there's just a lot to be learned. We have to be clear, it's not the same. So people would say, well, let's just take that aviation thing and, you know, apply it here. You got to tailor it. And I say that because, you know, on roadways, you're talking about millisecond difference between safe and a crash, right? Very different from aviation, just, just the envelope there of what, you know, but we have a lot to learn and we should be doing that everywhere. Yeah, and, and, and I know aviation is coming up to a, an issue that we're going to then talk about in, in cars is, is congestion and whether it's a busy airport or a busy airway, you know, again, the challenge is, is to get the vehicle uh, loaded with passengers from point A to point B in a safe manner. To your point in the air, maybe you, you, know, you can go back and forth 50, 100 feet and not hit something. You certainly can't do that on a roadway. But let's, let's talk about congestion on the roadways because you know, when we, uh, again, we're first talking about automation or fully autonomous, we were all gonna have one and the vehicles would be running around doing errands for us and such. And that would really clog things up, we finally <laughs> kind of realized. So let's talk about how does an autonomous vehicle or the development uh, aid in, in congestion, as you mentioned, mobility. So let me make the general comment first, which is what you're first getting to here is that all of the potential issues that could be addressed, congestion, safety, et cetera, we're not gonna flip a switch and everything changes. These things are gonna take years for systems to come into place. And I always say this, it's like, even if Zooks had the perfect vehicle on the road, there's still other people with their hands on the wheel, ATIS, other vehicles. It's like, you're not gonna see zero the next day. It takes time. So the same thing with the issue you're bringing up, congestion. As you know, there are some projects that have actually shown when you bring ride hail into a city can actually increase the congestion because there's a large percentage of time people are just roaming around looking for rides, right? Ready for their next pickup kind of thing. So I think the key there is not just to the lessons learned, but as we get more automated to have efficient algorithms and those algorithms are gonna make sure that vehicles aren't just cruising, looking for someone to pick up. They're going from A to B. When they drop off at B, they're picking up somebody who's ready to go to C. That's how we work to make sure that we may be actually decreasing, which is what we're after, decreasing the number of vehicles, say in a city center, as opposed to increasing them. But we're looking at efficiencies to be able to get us there. Well, you mentioned Zooks, and I want to take a little bit of time. Uh, we just have 10 minutes left or so. Uh, to talk about the vehicle. And with your broad background, you know, again, we don't want to make a commercial of it, but I think it's very interesting to see the vehicle. Mary, I know you have some uh, photos uh, of the Zooks vehicle because it is unique for those that uh, haven't seen it before. It isn't just making an autonomous car. It's making an entire vehicle. Um, let's talk a little bit about its design and, and its utilization. Yeah, and I'm, I'm actually going to start with a question that often comes my way, which is, you know, why Zooks? And I already said this, as a recovering NASA scientist, I love big, bold moonshots. And what I liked about Zooks is it's like, what should the future look like? Let's go build it. And so to your point, we're looking at a vehicle that is built from the ground up specifically for autonomy. And for you, the rider, rather than designed around a driver in the front left seat. And so... You know, we're already seeing other designs, et cetera, but I can talk specifically about this one as at least one model of what that future could look like. And so this vehicle, again, is really designed around the riders. 
It's designed for autonomy, which means the sensors can be placed in optimal positions. Um, I think what's fascinating, it's not only fully autonomous, but it's all electric, have a big battery, so it can basically operate all day, and it's bi-directional. So there is no front or back. You know, when you pull into a parking place, um, when it pulls out, it's going forward again. Okay, so you see sliding doors. You're never gonna have somebody opening a door into a bike lane or pedestrians. It's got sliding doors. You see it's built for ride sharing. You could have this on your own or with your family, um, but you could also be in a ride sharing. And it's made, you can just see a totally different kind of environment than having those front versus back seat, right? That we have in traditional kinds of vehicles. Um, and this just shows the vehicle being constructed. A lot of questions that we got at Zooks was, you know, it's pretty expensive and labor intensive to start a whole new manufacturing line, et cetera. Um, but the model we've used at Zooks is basically, we design um, to our specifications what we want in the vehicle. Tier one suppliers create modules. They come to Zooks and we do the final assembly. And that's pretty important because we got to put the compute and all the sensors and the calibration in to make sure it's done right. Um, but it means that we're not starting a huge manufacturing with paint facilities and all that kind of stuff. Um, not that it's easy, but it's way more straightforward than starting uh, manufacturing plants kind of thing. Um, and I love this slide because it shows you literally with the pieces being, you know, put into the vehicle, which you saw previously, which is pretty cool. Yeah. Um, and, and the other thing that you mentioned, and I think this is a great illustration of the fact that it can go front and back. It's got steering on uh, all four corners. And so a relatively small vehicle. So again, it, it, it can get around. And I just love, you know, the imaginative, uh, the design that just suggests that we think about transportation differently. And that's it. You know, I, I mean, I think that's a question for people is what should the future look like? And so let's build that. And at least for Zooks, that's what you're looking at here. And I think you've, we've talked about the pandemic so much, but we just showed this in December of 20, 2020, um, but so few people have actually been able to sit in it or touch it, um, but it's real. Uh, it's on uh, track being tested. It's in crash tests being tested. And while it's designed for cities, it actually can go up to 75 miles per hour. Um, and so, you know, it's a fully capable vehicle for a wide application. And, and I'll just add, it's a platform. You know, people love to ask, uh, once Zooks was acquired by Amazon, does that mean you're, you know, just delivering packages? Um, we're focused on moving people in cities in congested environments. Um, but when you think about it, what you just saw is a platform that you could actually make bigger if you wanted to carry larger numbers of people. You could, you know, put... Um, package modules and stuff in there and do that. It's a platform. And I think for all of us, we want to see those platforms be successful. That will give us many, many options for the future. Yeah. Now you are, as I mentioned, and I keep wanting to say as you, and again, as you mentioned, the chief safety officer, but chief safety innovation officer. We, we talked about the one report from NHTSA. I know uh, you guys issued a report, Zooks issued a report some time ago about uh, uh, safety, and you highlighted a number of the features. Can you talk about them specifically, some of your favorites, some of the innovation that you guys are uh, bringing forward? Thank you, thank you, thank you, Charlie. Because I got to tell you, that report, I mean, that's why I went to Zoots, you know, was to really see us innovate in the safety arena. So that report acknowledges over 100 safety innovations that we've designed and built into the vehicle. And that report talks about nine of them in three different areas. One has to do with driver control. And so it's things like you've already highlighted, the four-wheel steering, independent braking, um, and then the second one has to do with our design objective of no single point of failure. So that's aviation level safety envelope into automotive, okay? Um, and again, that has a lot to do with redundancies and monitors and that kind of things. And then the third has to do with rider protection. So that we take even traditional things like airbags and seatbelts and then think about how do we add innovation? And I'll just give you some concrete example there, which is in our vehicle, it won't move until your seatbelt is fastened. Okay, so get, you know, think about some of the other things we talked about earlier. It won't, and the airbags, when you don't have that steering wheel right in the front left driver's seat, you get to totally reimagine what should an airbag protection system look like. I hope people go, zooks.com slash safety. Look at that safety report. We have a wonderful diagram of a totally new airbag system 
that's got a curtain that comes down from the ceiling, individual protection, and then a whole bunch of other airbags for side, back of the head, et cetera. You get to reimagine what safety could look like. Wow. You, you, one of the things you said in your description is about the driver. You made mention of that. And obviously, in the end, there won't be a driver in commercial utilization. It, it, it adds... Uh, me think and wonder how do you get that certified obviously you're you know if it's, is it fully autonomous or is there a, a driver portion that then gets removed after certification how do you get that on the road yeah we I, that's a question we get all the time we don't talk a lot about it okay. um, but we did feel that it was important to be able to self-certify our vehicle within the current structure of what exists um, and the reason for that, as you know, is people have been looking for legislation that change exemptions and this and that, but there's so many limitations. It's really hard to think about how you scale by doing it through an, a, an exemption or some exception. So we're going to do it within the current system. Gotcha. And, and then you did mention Amazon, but let's just talk about commercial package delivery. And we've already mentioned that's become a big part through this pandemic in terms of our own communities and, and what that means. Uh, do you see this as a, uh, maybe rolling out first in a package world, a commercial world versus a passenger world? Uh, well, I can pretty much say that our focus and objective is all about moving people. Okay. Um, and from the highest levels of Amazon, I can tell you we have stayed on that path. Um, so it's been about a year since the acquisition. We've stayed on that path, we will continue. But to your point, as I said, we have a platform. So even before we engaged Amazon, we have models of what that vehicle could look like, but delivering or picking up packages. So again, once you have that platform operating, then you'll be able to use it for all kinds of different applications, including package delivery. Awesome. Well, I can't believe it, Mark, but we're, we're out of time. Um, a couple quick, I wanna give you the opportunity for any closing comment, if there's anything we didn't cover and say with admiration, as you move your hand, uh, your right hand, uh, you, you, a space shuttle uh, model that's behind you appears and disappears. And I, I'm enjoying seeing that, but uh, any closing <laughs> comments are welcome. So one, I'll just say, I wanted to use the background here. I love showing mine because it literally has from space shuttle to Apollo, because I've been fortunate to know moonwalkers in my life and it just yeah. changes what you do. And I'll use that because I really think we have an opportunity for that big, bold safety advantage that we're looking for. Instead of just being in a crisis, lurching from crisis to crisis, new technology, not just automated vehicles, but new technology gives us an advantage to advance safety like we've never seen in the last hundred years. We have to do it safely, but we got to take full advantage for the full benefit. Mark Rosekind, the Chief Safety Innovation Officer at Zooks. We really appreciate you being a participant as you have through the years at uh, the World Safety Summit and look forward to, uh, again, any and all success in safety. Thanks so much for your time. Good to Charlie, see you. Charlie, it is always a pleasure. Well, look forward to seeing you in person next time. Yeah. yeah.